Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Hello and welcome to a lecture on gender and literature uh, in this course that we're doing. And today we're going to talk about a short story uh, called The Fly by Catherine Mansfield. Uh, so we had covered already, as you know, uh, you know some of the texts that we uh, are supposed to do in this particular course, along with the theoretical apparatus and the theoretical component, uh, which is also necessary and is a part of this particular course. So we just finished with Heart of Darkness by Joseph Conrad, uh, prior to which we finished a Shooting an Elephant by George Orwell, uh, and before that, of course, uh, Munshi Premchand's The Chess Plays by Shatran Shikhlari. So in this particular short story, we are going to look at female write-up. So this is a very interesting short story because it looks at aspects such as uh, the female condition, uh, masculinity crisis, an entire vocation of gender, the entire uh, reconfiguration of gender, uh, which took place uh, after a particular political event. And the political event in this short story is the First World War. So essentially, it's a war story. It's one of the finest uh, short stories written out of the First World War experience, uh, the entire experience of the First World War, the trauma of the war, uh, the experience of loss, the experience of alienation, the experience of despair, dissolution, disappointment. So all these things come together in a very interesting uh, way in this particular short story. And what it does, uh, and this is why it interests us, for those of us who look at gender and literature, what it does very uh, skillfully is, is a really well written short story. It's magnificent craft in there, as you will see uh, as we move on. What this short story does is it completely uh, you know, changes the coordinates of masculinity, femininity, uh, the location of agency in masculinity, the location of agency in femininity. Uh, it's completely changed. It's a very radical revision uh, through a very painful process, of course, which took place, which takes place in this particular short story. And in many sense, this short story is a very faithful and authentic and artistic reflection uh, of the condition uh, that, to, that was happening, that was prevalent uh, after the First World War. Uh, the condition of loss, the condition of alienation, the condition of reconfiguration which took place after the First World War. Now, before I dive into the short story, uh, I'll do something similar to what I did uh, when we read Heart of Darkness. I'll give you a, a, an idea of the cultural background uh, of this particular literary text. Uh, a background which produced this text. So, what were the cultural conditions, what were the political conditions, what were the economic conditions uh, at that point of time out of which this short story was produced. Now, the moment I say it is a first world war short story, uh, you know, the automatic assumption that uh, everyone has and quite rightly so is that it is a short story about loss, it is about human loss. Uh, it's about the loss of life, it's about the loss of memory, it's about the loss of fond memories, it's about the loss of uh, a fulfilling, enriching life. And that, that is something the short story uh, is, deals with. It, it represents it in a very uh, interesting and complex kind of a way. Now, uh, when we t talk about loss in First World War, uh, the real condition of loss in First World War was quite uh, is appalling. I mean, the number of people who died in the First World War, the number of people who were paralyzed in the First World War. Uh, is appalling and it was uh, the first real war in human history which was fought uh, in, a, in a global scale. I mean almost no part of the world uh, was unaffected by the first world war as you know. So there were people dying in uh, almost every part of the planet. Uh, the people dying, the people losing their relatives, the people losing their loved ones uh, in almost every part of the planet and that is something which happens a lot uh, in, uh, extensively uh, in almost in the entirety of the world war fiction that we have including novels, uh, short stories, poems and this, as you know, there is some really interesting uh, war poetry written by the war poets. People who actually went and fought in the First World War, came back and wrote a poetry about the experience, about the trauma of the experience, about the feeling of alienation, about the feeling of loss, etc. So that is the different genre of literature that uh, people deal with when they want to read the relationship between literature and trauma and the entire idea of war poetry. People like Suzun, uh, you know, Graves, uh, Owen. So these are primary war poets who wrote uh, in the poetry in English 
uh, about the experiences in the trenches of the First World War. Now, I mean, obviously, what the World War does did historically it, 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 it created this massive scale of causality uh, where you know, thousands of people died uh, in just a single day. Uh, so the very opening of the war, the very first of the war, so you know, thousands of people dying. So you know, the, the amount of causality, the amount of human loss, the degree of human loss was unprecedented. So this is what I mean when I say this was the first war in human history which was truly fought on a global scale. So it was an industrial warfare, uh, it was a machinic warfare, so people uh, instead of hand to hand combat the entire grammar of uh, fighting change in the first world war, it was more machinic, it was more industrial, so people were getting killed at you know, great distances, you know, you just press a switch and someone dies 50 miles away. So, you know, all these you know, different configurations of you know, battling, of war, of warfare, violence, uh, these generated, together, these generated uh, a, a sense of emotional response to the First World War. And that emotional response to a great extent was repression. Uh, so, there was a lot of repression after the First World War, people who came back uh, from the war, uh, people who fought in the war, and also people who lost their you know, loved ones in the war, they were essentially a group of repressed people. They could not really describe, they could not really talk about what happened because it was something which hap was happening for the first time. So it was completely a changed mode of warfare, as I mentioned. Uh, it sort of moved away from the hand to hand combat model of warfare into a more industrial, into a more machinic, into a more automatic model of warfare, a more automated kind of violence uh, whereby people you know, were able to kill other people uh, you know, by being you know, a great distance away. And it was also to a great extent, the anonymity of the enemy was also a very important factor. You couldn't see who your enemy was. You couldn't recognize, you could not know, uh, you could not see in person who your enemy was. So, you know, killing someone that you don't know, killing someone you don't see, you can't see. So, all these experiences which were sort of largely unprecedented before the First World War. So, all this together generated uh, a very interesting, a very complex experience of alienation, repression uh, and of course depression after the First World War. And the most important thing is uh, people were finding it very difficult to come to terms with the loss. Uh, people were finding it very difficult to come to terms with the violence that they experienced uh, in the trenches. So people who came back after the First World War, uh, they were almost, uh, you know, they, find, they found it almost impossible to talk about the experiences in the First World War trenches because again, this was something which did not happen before, right? So this is not a kind of battle, this is not a kind of warfare that they were used to as soldiers. So when they came back after the First World War, they were unable to tell about, the, they were unable to express their experiences. And a very fine text which uh, is entirely, almost entirely about this inability to talk about the experience of the First World War after the soldier comes back to the civilian space is uh, Virginia Woolf's Mrs. Dalloway, uh, which is obviously a very fine novel, a very fine modernist novel, but it has one soldier called Septimus Smith who comes back from the trenches uh, having fought the battle for England and then he comes back to London and he can't tell anyone uh, what he's experiencing. He can't tell anyone the true extent of his loss, the true extent of his experiences because, you know, he's a repressed person, okay? So, you know, all these very interesting and complex medical symptoms uh, appeared after the First World War, which again, uh, in, in the history of medicine were unprecedented. And one of which, uh, which was very popular and some, was something which caught on and the cultural and popular collective imagination was something called shell shock. And the shell shock uh, in the First World War uh, was something which happened to soldiers when they came back from the trenches. And now, again, it was a very psychological kind of a situation. And again, uh, like the violence, this too in medical history had no uh, precedent. And so there was no instance of shell shock before the First World War. So people did not know. I mean, obviously people did get traumatized after coming back from the war, but not to this scale. So this was a collective kind of an experience. So lots of soldiers came back after the First World War, completely shell shock. And the term shell shock, which is uh, um, coined by someone called Charles Mayers, uh, M-E-Y-E-R-S, it was again uh, something which hadn't happened before in medical history. So people could not quite deal with it. Uh, the, the, the doctors uh, who were trying to treat the patients, trying to treat the soldiers, did not know how to deal with shell shock. So this was a time uh, after the First World War where something called psychoanalysis, uh, those of us who read literature would know what psychoanalysis is, it suddenly became very, very um, popular, it suddenly became very, very uh, talked about. And someone called Sigmund Freud, again, uh, you know, those of us who study literature and psychology are very acquainted with this name, Sigmund Freud. So he was one of the founding figures of psychoanalysis. So he became, he was in London at that point of time, so he became extremely uh, talked about, he became extremely significant after the First World War because 
he offered an apparatus, he offered a way of looking at the human mind which was sort of unprecedented before and that sort of helped to a great extent uh, in talking about trauma and dealing with loss and dealing with emotions etc. Okay? Now, so this was the cultural, medical, psychological, political situation, uh, the entirety of Europe was cracking up and this was the beginning, one might say, the beginning of the end of European imperialism, the First World War. Because you know, the, this would fall, be followed by the Second World War and by the time the Second World War ended, uh, almost all the empires of Europe were cracking up, were breaking down and you know, uh, so we moved on from a colonial imperial Europe to a post-colonial Europe. Uh, so, we, no longer was Europe a major power, no longer was Europe uh, a, a, a major player in, the, in the global politics. So, after the Second World War, as you know, the, the global players in, in, in world politics became the USA and the USSR. And it's something we'll talk about more extensively when we look at the next text in our course, which is Look Back in Anger. But for the moment, it's important to understand that the First World War was the beginning of the end of European civilization to a great extent. Uh, but by civilization, I mean the construct of European superiority. Uh, the constructive European masculinity, the constructive European idea of femininity and masculinity, etc. And of course, uh, tied to all this is the entire idea of imperialism. So, the First World War was the first real hit against imperialism. It, it sort of completely crippled Europe to a great extent. The, the degree of violence with, that Europe faced and experienced uh, in the First World War was massive. Uh, and this was again, uh, it, it revealed to the European uh, person, to the European self, the constructive quality of European civilization. That is not a given, it is not something which is unanimous, unanimously and globally uh, venerable. It is something which can be broken down very, very easily. It is something which can beget violence very, very easily. Because the first war was, was an almost entirely about European violence. It was a white man's violence. Uh, so, this extent of violence as I just mentioned, where, you know, which was unprecedented in human history, uh, was a very telling reminder, was a very telling reflection of the constructive quality, the fragility of the European civilization. Uh, the fragility of the European sense of self, the fragility of the European sense of uh, and, and the humanness, humanity, etc. So, along with the economic, uh, so obviously, uh, if you look at the economy in the First World War, post First World War, the economy, were, lots of countries in Europe began to become bankrupt. And by the time we come to the Second World War, uh, bankruptcy has almost become a European phenomenon, uh, so a continental phenomenon uh, to a great extent. So, you know, they could not afford the war anymore. So, you know, eco economically, psychologically, medically, historically, culturally, politically, so in every sense of the term, the First World War was a massive attack, a massive hit against the European ontology of the self, the European ontology of civilization and superiority. So, that was, that may be seen, the war may be seen as a paradigm shift in an understanding of the human self, an understanding of the human uh, masculinity, femininity, the very idea of gender, the very idea of the self, the very idea of uh, the, you know, the being uh, so sort of began to shift after the First World War because of the extent of violence which happened in the First World War. Okay? So, this is a condition which produced uh, you know, this short story, The Fly. Now, of course, the other thing we need to be aware of very, very interestingly is that this is also the short story is a very interesting and a very complex critique of the entire masculinist principle which created the war. It is a critique of masculinity, it is a critique of this masculinist motive uh, of violence, expansion, imperialism, etc. So, we talked about this in great detail when we looked at Heart of Darkness and we saw how the entire idea of imp imp uh, you know, imperialism, the entire idea of the empire was an expansionist idea. It wanted to expand, it wanted to territorialize, it wanted, it was completely driven by this very masculinist profit motive. Uh, which was gearing the men, uh, fueling the entire desire to conquer, to conquest, uh, to basically uh, territorialize and take over and exploit other people in other parts of the world. So, this entire idea of expanding, of conquering, of territorializing were very masculinist ideas. And you know, the First World War can be seen as an extreme extension of this masculinist desire of invasion, this entire, this extreme ex expansion or extension of the masculinist desire for conquering, uh, for violence, for territorialization, etc. Okay? So, in that sense, the First World War can be seen uh, as a very monstrous reflection of uh, uh, imperialism, as a very monstrous reflection to the European man of what the empire really is. So, it is not something which is uh, a grand civilizing mission, uh, far from it. It is not something which is a rescuing mission, far from it. It is actually a monstrous mission of violence, exploitation, human causality and human loss. 
So the first world war in a very interesting sense can be seen as that monstrous reflection of European greed, of European violence, of European anarchy and so all this went against the entire principle of the superiority, the supposed principle of the superiority of Europe, the superiority of the European civilization in a way. So in that sense the first world war was not just a political event but also an ontological event, a philosophical event an epistemological event. And why epistemological? Because it, it brought about a change not just at the level of politics, not just the level of violence, but also the level of knowledge. Your idea of his, um, a sense of self change, your idea of your uh, own entire self change of the First World War as a European man, uh, everything changed after the First World War. So in that sense, it's a very, very interesting philosophical, psychological, ontological event. It's an event of paradigm shift uh, to a great extent. Okay? So, this is the kind of condition which uh, created the fly by Catherine Mansfield. Now, Catherine Mansfield, just to give you a little biographical detail about Catherine Mansfield, was a New Zealand born writer. She was born in New Zealand uh, and she's one of the finest writers of a short story. Uh, and she is now considered to be one of the greatest modernist writers of her times, uh, along with James Joyce, Virginia Woolf, T.S. Eliot. She's now ranked with w those people despite being an outsider. So, you know, by the word outsider, I mean, so she's not someone who is working, who was born in the heartland of Europe. She's not someone who is born in London or Vienna or Paris or Rome, but she's someone who came from New Zealand, which again, uh, may be regarded as a colony of the empire. It was a British colony at the time. Of course, she was a white person. So, she very much was the privileged person in the colony. But even so, uh, her entire negotiation where the European modernity, the European modernism, the, the art movement of modernity, modernism was quite complex. So, she was never really a comfortable insider uh, in this entire uh, modernist movement. Now, of course, she was a very fierce critique of patriarchy. She was a very fierce critique of heteronormativity. So, she practiced lesbianism uh, to a great extent in her life. Uh, she had a very, very adventurous life. She had you know, numerous uh, adventures, numerous affairs and numerous experiences which went against the entire patriarchal principle of uh, you know, preservation, conservation and protection of the female body, the female self. So, she went against it entirely uh, through her life. And the writing too is reflective of this uh, anti-establishment stance that it um, takes uh, in her own life. So, the writing itself is quite uh, subversive, the writing itself is quite anti-establishment, the writing itself is quite radical in many sense. So, the craft that she uses in her short fiction in a short story, uh, is a craft which is entirely geared to a subversion, is a craft which is entirely geared to us, uh, you know, questioning patriarchy, questioning the establishment, questioning the entire patriarchal principles of preservation, protection, preservation and perpetuation, right. So, again, uh, this brings us, this can be connected very interestingly to what we said, the phallogocentric nature uh, of classic realism, the phallogocentric nature which is attacked in Heart of Darkness. So, phallogocentric obviously is a combination of phallocentric and logocentric. So, it's a patriarchal logic, right? That is what is meant by the term phallogocentric. So, the entire phallogocentricity of human existence, the entire phallogocentricity of the European white man's existence was questioned, was radically questioned and deconstructed and destroyed in a way in the First World War. And what Mansfield does in this particular short story and in, in a, almost an entire over of her work is that she questions this phallogocentric principle, she questions this patriarchal principle, she questions this entire idea of masculinity, normative masculinity, normative femininity, this entire blunt binary between normative masculinity and normative femininity. That's constantly questioned in Mansfield's literature, in Mansfield's work, uh, uh, fiction, uh, whether it's a short story or the letters that she wrote, which again are quite interesting if you read those in the context of today. Now, so what happens in the fly? So, why is fly an important short story uh, in uh, world literature, in you know, gender and literature, etc. Now, to give you a very quick summary of the short story, which is something I will do in the first lecture, then I will move on to more specific textual details in the second lecture. The fly is a short story uh, about the entire patriarchal project of preservation. Okay? I will say that again, the fly is a short story of the entire patriarchal project of preservation. Now, what it does want to preserve is the idea of superiority, the idea of privilege, the idea of you know, uh, some kind of a supremacy of the white man. It wants to protect that, it wants to perpetuate that idea, despite the loss that it had faced in the First World War. And the short story is a satire against this project of preservation. The short story is a critique of this culture of preservation. The short story is an attack against this attempt at preservation. 
Okay? So it's a very feminist critique, it's a scouting feminist critique, it's a scouting feminist attack, feminist attack against this patriarchal project of preservation, protection and perpetuation. Okay? So the, there are four P's that we need to be aware of in this entire discourse. Production, protection, preservation and perpetuation, the four P's. Production, you produce a certain kind of masculinity, you produce a certain kind of commodity, you produce a certain kind of value system, so that's the production phase, that's one. Uh, second, obviously, you sort of preserve it, so you, you promote it, you preserve it, uh, and you, you sort of protect it against any kind of attack, uh, so that's third, protection. So, production, promotion, uh, protection, and of course, then, uh, you know, perpetuation or preservation. Right? So, you want to perpetuate it or preserve it forever. Right? So, production, promotion, protection and perpetuation. The four P's in the patriarchal principle of you know, whether you are talking about commodity, whether you are talking about the value system, whether you are talking about the empire, whether you are talking about the entire discourse of masculinity and femininity, the four P's are very, very important. So, I give you all these little abbreviations which are helpful conceptually, I believe. Uh, so, for example, just to you know, brush up on the memory thing, uh, I did give you the, the three M's which were uh, historically significant in any history of imperialism. So, you know, the first M was of course, of course the merchant, the, the merchant who came, the mercantile presence, uh, which came at the beginning of imperialism, uh, and that was followed by the military presence, uh, which was followed subsequently and eventually by the missionary presence, so which was you know, out there to convert people and to make them into uh, consensual subjects. Uh, so, you know, the military will force you by force, um, will uh, you know, appeal to you by force, but the missionary will appeal to you through consent. Then you become a, a, a happy consumer of privilege, a happy consumer of the white man's superiority. So, again, that will connect us to uh, what we saw in uh, Shruti in Elephant, where the Burmese people are very happily consuming the white man's privilege to the extent that they want the white man to perpetuate the privilege. Right? So, again, uh, you know, the perpetuation thing becomes important in shooting an elephant. So, the four P's over here are important. Production, promotion, protection and perpetuation. Right? So, these are the four P's that we deal with uh, in this particular short story. And what this short story does is that it completely breaks these four P's. It completely goes against it, attacks, it critiques the entire uh, politics of production, the entire politics of preservation, the entire politics of promotion and the entire politics of protection. Right? It, it shows us very clearly uh, and very brutally actually that the entire masculinist idea of production of a certain kind of masculinity, production of a certain kind of commodity, production of a certain kind of value system is basically a construct and it is a very evil construct. That is what a short story tells us. It is a very evil construct. It is not something uh, that we should not be celebrating. It is not something that we should not be uh, you know, glorifying uh, through a romantic rhetoric or otherwise. Okay? So, this is a short story which can be read, which should be read, I think, as a very strong feminist satire against this entire uh, phallocentric logic of production. Okay? So, this is a satire, a very scathing satire of this entire patriarchy, the project of patriarchy, of phallocentricism, which is depicted in the short story as fragile, as weak, as senile, as sinister. At the same time, it is something which is broken down in the end. Uh, as mercilessly broken down, as brutally broken down and it is revealed to be a very fragile construct. So, masculinity in this short story, the European value system in this short story, uh, they, these are far from universal uh, given categories. These are revealed to be constructed categories, a very fragile constructs which can be broken down by any event, which can be broken down by any act of remembrance, which can be broken down by any act of forgetting. So, far from being superior, far from the superiority, the supposed superiority of these categories, what is revealed in the short story is a fragility. So, the movement in the short story is from superiority to fragility, right? Superiority of the European man, superiority of the European idea of life, superiority of the European idea of memory to the fragility of the same. So, it is revealed to be a very fragile thing, it is revealed to be a very weak thing, a very senile thing, a very weak thing, a very fragile thing. It is not something which, is, uh, which can sustain itself. Uh, it is broken down in the end and it will, it will break in the end. So, this is a conceptual framework of the short story. And I wanted to give you the cultural framework, the conceptual framework before I moved into uh, the real short story. And now I will so start talking about the short story and I will talk about how it is important and why we should study it in a course on gender and literature. 
So this short story, The Fly, which is one of the finest things that Mansfield ever wrote, is about a man called The Boss. Okay? Now, we, don't, we never get to know the name of The Boss. We never get to know his real name, whether he had a name, that's not revealed to us. He's just called The Boss uh, in the short story. And obvi obviously, uh, as people who interpret texts, people who uh, do close readings of literary texts, we should be aware of the fact that the moment someone is called a boss in a short story or in a novel or any literary text, the, uh, the automatic assumption is that he is supposedly in a position of authority. He is supposedly in a position of power, in a position of privilege. That's why he's called a boss. So, you know, so the boss in a short story, he starts off, when the short story begins, he starts off in a position of privilege. He starts off in a position of power. Okay, and that's very clearly uh, given to us, it's very clearly depicted to us, represented to us, uh, reflected to us uh, in the narrator. So, he is someone who enjoys privilege, he is someone who is in a position of privilege, he's occupying the privileged position at the beginning of this short story. So, he's called the boss. Now, in complete contrast to the boss, we have another man called Mr. Woody Field. So, if you read the short story, uh, so, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll send you an online link. Uh, I'll mention an online link and if you just google up uh, The Fly by Catherine Mansfield, you should be able to get uh, a very good online edition of the short story which you can read and which you should read for the purpose of this particular course. Now, in complete contrast to the boss, we have the figure of Mr. Woody Field. Now, uh, the Woody Field appears in the short story as someone who is senile, someone who is basically uh, very weak, uh, is losing his uh, memory, is losing his organic function. Uh, is not very strong, not very stout. Uh, so, he is he's a picture in a way of a decadent masculinity. He is a picture in a way of a very senile, wasted kind of a masculinity. He is someone who is sort of on his way out as you can say. Uh, you know, he is someone who is sort of dying and he does not have a lot of good years ahead of him uh, biologically, metabolically. He is on his way out. He is sort of a washout in a way and he is very old. However, Interestingly, uh, he is younger than the boss. He's five years younger than the boss. So the, the obvious assumption, the obvious picture we get of the boss is that despite his age, he's older than Woodyfield. Uh, so Woodyfield is very weak and senile. But the boss, despite his age, uh, is someone who's very strong, someone who's very stout, someone who's very rosy, someone who's still at the helm of power, someone who's still in control of everything in life. So. The short story opens, Kathy Mansfield is a fly, the short story opens with uh, a picture of the boss's office. We, we, the setting is the boss's office. The entire short story take place, takes place inside the office space of the boss. And the picture with the, that we get of the office is a picture of prosperity, a picture of progress, a picture of you know, abundance, a picture of a very uh, you know, productive masculinity. Right? So, we get uh, an office space which is very well designed. It's got electric heating, it's got lots of lovely gadgets, it's got lots of lo lovely furniture, uh, it's got it's newly done up and that's something we get to know in the short story that it's been done up recently. So, he's, got a, he's had a makeover in his, uh, in his office. So, the, the, obviously the, the, the assumption is the picture that we get uh, 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 immediately is that this is a person who wants to be in control, this is a person who wants to sort of uh, do new things all the time. Despite his age, he's someone who is trying to be in power, uh, someone who is in power, someone who is in privilege and in his office space is a reflection of his privilege. So, we get a picture of electric heating, we get a picture of new furniture, we get a picture of a new desk, we get a picture of uh, you know new kind of uh, you know, gadgets around him. So, you know in a very interesting way, in a very straightforward way, the short story gives you a picture of abundance, uh, success, uh, manly success, patriarchal success, prosperity, uh, you know, privilege, power, position, authority, etc. So, this, this, is a, this is a point in which the short story begins. It opens to that kind of a point. So, the picture we have of the boss is that of a stereotypically powerful man, someone who is a social success, someone who is uh, you know, a strong man, someone who is in control of his life, someone who is in control of his career, someone who is in control of his uh, you know, entire standing, uh, social, professional and you know, standing in life in general. So, someone who is really doing well in life, uh, a man, a big, strong, successful man. That is the picture we get of the boss at the beginning of the short story. Now, just to give you a little biographical detail uh, and this is important uh, in reading the fly. Now, Mansfield's, uh, there, there is a very good reason to believe that the picture of the boss in Kathy Mansfield's short story is basically a picture of Mansfield's own father. 
so he, he was someone, uh, if you read any biography of Mansfield, Mansfield's relationship with his father was quite complex. And he comes across in Mansfield's uh, autobiographies and letters, uh, biographies and letters, sorry, uh, as someone who's authoritative, someone who uh, enjoys privilege, someone who's very patriarchally privileged, uh, someone who's very phallocentric, etc. So he is someone uh, who may have been the model uh, for Mansfield when he when she characterized the, the uh, figure of the boss in the fly. Right? So the figure of the boss in the fly, especially the way uh, in the, when the story opens, is that of something very similar to Mansfield's own father, uh, a patriarchal, uh, a patriarch, someone who is you know, in a position of privilege, someone who is in a position of power, someone who enjoys authority, someone who enjoys you know, someone who has a sense of entitlement, etc. So that is the picture we get uh, at the beginning of the short story. In complete contrast to that, we have Woodyfield as I mentioned, uh, who uh, sits there uh, chatting with the boss, uh, who is shivering, uh, who does not know what to say, uh, who basically uh, and, and the story makes it very clear at the very beginning that he is basically on his way out. But then just despite the fact that he is younger than a boss and this is interesting that he is really in terms of age he is younger than a boss, but that does not make him. Uh, more powerful, that doesn't make him more strong. So, he's someone who is basically very weak and senile, and that's something which is already makes quite clear at the beginning of the short and beginning of the narrative. Now, uh, the story opens, as I mentioned, with the boss situated very, very stoutly, very robustly inside his office space, which is surrounded by new gadgets, new heating, new furniture, etc. And he, very, uh, you know, in a very direct, explicit way, he shows off his success to Woodyfield. So, he is sitting there reading the Financial Times newspaper, which he slits open with a paper knife. Uh, the, the, the description is very, very quick. So, he has got a lot of, uh, you know, you know his, his motor movements, his muscular movements are very strong, uh, very swift, uh, and is in complete control of his nerves, is in complete control of his situation, and he so, starts to show off his office to Woody Field. And that gives him, in a very interesting sense, a sense of narcissistic pleasure, uh, a sense of superiority. Uh, he feels better about himself, he feels better about his life when he is showing off this entire architecture of his office to Woody Field, who sits there in a muffler and the narrative tells us that he is a frail old figure in a muffler. So, he is almost like a mummy, right? he is not someone, uh, he's, al he's almost mummified, he is not someone who is a human being anymore, he is on his way out, uh, he is basically hollowed out by life, he is mummified and he is a frail old figure in a muffler in contrast to the boss who is sitting there very stout very strong, very rosy and still going very, very well despite his age. Okay? So, this is something which the story makes quite clear. So, immediately we have two different models of masculinity in the short story. So, one is this patriarchal, stout, robust, reasonable, successful model of masculinity uh, which is embodied of course by the boss whose name we do not know and in contrast to that we have the other model of masculinity which is frail, senile, uh, someone who is shivering, someone who is obviously not in control uh, of his senses, of his nerves and that is Woodyfield. That is a masculinity embodied by Woodyfield. Okay? So, we have these two models of masculinity with which the story opens and obviously uh, as we as we know uh, who is the more manly of the two men. Right? And that is something which the story makes quite clear at the beginning. You know, it is quite directly and explicitly clear that the boss is supposed to be seen as a manly, successful, robust man who is completely in control of his life, of his profession, of his career, of his emotions. So, he is completely in control, he is someone of a controller, right? he is an authoritative, privileged controller. That is the figure of the boss that we get at the beginning of the short story. Now, uh, Interestingly, uh, if you read the short story, which you should uh, for the purpose of this particular course, when you see the architecture of the office of the boss, so it has got lots of electric heating, furniture, uh, lovely knives, uh, the financial times and all this is lovely uh, and that is obviously reflective of the boss's success, the social success, his, in a, his professional success, uh, his emotional success, he seems to be situated at the center of success. So, he is very much a center and he is the center of success in the short story, at least at this point in the short story when the story opens. However, there is one thing which the narrative draws attention to and it says quite clearly that while the boss is showing off uh, his various gadgets, his various uh, very phallic gadgets and you know, if you look at the gadgets in, in Mansfield's uh, in that particular setting, they are very phallic, uh, they are very phallus like and that is obviously reflective of the, uh, the very phallocentric privilege that the boss wants to enjoy. Uh, that a very phallocentric privilege that, that the boss wants to inhabit and occupy and situate himself in. 
and that's very much there, that entire phallocentric privilege. Okay? Now, uh, when he's showing off these very phallic gadgets to Winifield with a narcissistic pleasure of superiority, now there's one object that the narrator tells us that it does not show to Winifield, and that object is a photograph of a boy. Okay? And this is interesting. There is a photograph of a boy that he does not show to Winifield. He does not draw the attention of Winifield to that photograph. And this is interesting because what it does is that we as readers, we are immediately uh, curious, we are immediately inquisitive, we are immediately, uh, we sort of begin to know, begin to ask what is this photograph, who is in the photograph, okay? And we don't know yet, we, we're not given the information yet, uh, you know, in that short story. So all we know at this point is that he did not show off this photograph to Woodyfield. And this is a complete contrast to the other things that he's doing. He's showing off almost everything he has to Woodyfield, okay? despite that photograph. And that photograph is not shown to Woodyfield. But we get to know now, and this is, a, uh, this is such a lovely craft of narration, whereby we are told, we are given a certain information uh, by telling us, you know, and that is a process in which we are told that this information was not given to the other person, but by default the information comes to us. It's a very indirect way to convey a certain kind, a certain information, a certain bit of information that we get to know in this short story. And then obviously we are curious, we are inquisitive, we want to know more. But the narrative moves on from there. It doesn't, doesn't dwell on that particular topic uh, for much longer. It just is sort of a blink and a miss kind of a thing where you just get one line, one, one half sentence which uh, tells us he did not draw the attention of Woodyfield to that one boy, a grave looking boy in soldier's uniform. Now, this is interesting. And this is the first bit in a short story where we get to know that this may have something to do with the war. But we don't know anything. We don't know anything except for this. Right? So, we just get to see that there is a photograph of a young boy in a soldier's uniform. And that's all we get to know at this point. We, we don't have any other information, we don't have any other details about the boy, about the photograph, about the soldier's uniform. We know nothing. We just know it's there. Uh, you know, it's just situated there and somewhere in boss's table. But that's something he does not show off to other people. Okay? Now, uh, then the narrative moves on and it further consolidates the superiority of the boss. Uh, and that is done uh, very cleverly by looking, by, by describing the inferiority, the senility of Woodyfield. So, the senility of Woodyfield is contrasted with the superiority of the boss. So, Woodyfield says he had come there uh, to uh, tell something to the boss, to say something to the boss, but he can't remember, he can't seem to remember what it was. Okay? So, he got out in the morning, uh, you know, when he came to visit the boss, he had something in mind, he had something he wanted to say to the boss, but he, for the life of him, he cannot remember what it was. Now, we get a little description about Winifield uh, at this point, and we are told that he is someone who is uh, presumably retired, he is someone who is basically confined to his house, except on Tuesday. And on Tuesdays, uh, he is dressed up by his wife and his daughters, and he is sent off to the city. He is allowed to go to the city on Tuesdays, and then he, that's the day when he visits his old friends, that's the day when he visits his old uh, relatives, buddies, uh, etc. And that's the only day of freedom that he has. Okay? Now, for the rest of the week, he is completely um, you know, imprisoned, confined in his house. Uh, for obviously, and we, we sort of guess it's probably because of medical reasons. He's a very old man and he's not to be trusted uh, you know, health wise. And that's, so that's why he's confined and cared by, in his house by his daughters and his wife. And he's the only day it was allowed to go out is Tuesday. Now, what that shows us immediately, and this is interesting, is that this is a kind of culture where the men are controlled by the women. Right? This is a kind of culture where the women are in control. The women are decision makers. The women basically uh, tell the men what to, to, what to do and who to do, who to see and you know, what not to do, etc. Okay? So, and this is, uh, and I'm going to talk a little bit now about the social condition of this time, the cultural condition of this time, or more importantly, the demographic condition of this time. So, if we look at the demography, uh, after the First World War, uh, immediately after the First World War, uh, Europe, we will find that the number of young men after the First World War decreased dramatically. Right? There was a dramatic decrease in the number of young men, uh, purely because that most of the men who went to fight for the war, they had to go and fight for the war, uh, in the war, they died or they came back crippled and paralyzed. So, there were very few healthy young men after the First World War. So, the entire demography after the First World War, uh, you know, is basically constituted by old men who are too old to go and fight for in the war and women. 
Okay? And we know if we do a sociological study of Europe, if we do a sociological study of the, the countries which are actively participating in the First World War, we know that immediately after the First World War, the women began to take up occupations which were previously just controlled by men. And these included uh, being tram conductors, this included, included being working in post offices, this included being bus conductors, this included being you know, drivers of buses and trams, etc. Because the simple reason that there were not enough men available after the First World War. Most of the young men who were doing these jobs, who were controlling these jobs, uh, were either killed or crippled by the war. Okay? So it was a necessity, a social necessity for the woman to come up and continue with these jobs, continue with this profession. So it's very interesting if we look at the demographic study after the First World War. Now, bearing this in mind, and this is something that I just told you, so you have an idea of the cultural and social and demographic condition of First World War Europe. Bearing this in mind, if we come to, first, if we come to the short story, The Fly, by Catherine Mansfield, we'll find that if you read the short story, there is no young men in the short story. The entire short story is peopled by old men and women. Okay? And the only young man mentioned in the short story is a dead young man. Someone who's dead. And we get to know in the course of the short story that that person is the boss's son. Again, he's unnamed. He's anonymous. He's not named. Okay? So, you know, he's someone who died in the war and he's symptomatic or symbolic, he's reflective of the number of men, he's the face of the young men who went and fought in the war and were killed in the war. So the entire demography in the short story, uh, The Fly, is reflective of the real demography in Europe after the First World War. So this is a cultural condition, this is a demographic condition where, uh, you know, the entire population is peopled by women and old men. And there are very few healthy, normal young men left. Okay? So this, if you, if you take this and we come back to short story and if you see that section where we get to know that Woody Field, the frail old man who has come to visit the boss, now he is tied up in his house for the entirety of the week except Tuesdays and on Tuesdays he is brushed up, dressed up and sent off to the city, allowed to go to the city by the woman. So again, the word allow over here is important which basically implies that a woman have agency over here. It's a woman who have the position of being the decision maker. Over here. Because would you feel the man is not crippled, he's paralyzed, uh, he's someone who's on his way out, someone who's senile, etc. Okay? So he's allowed to come to the city uh, on Tuesdays, he's allowed to visit his friends on Tuesdays, he's allowed to go out and do whatever he wants to on Tuesdays. So it, the, we get to know now that this is a Tuesday, that when he's come to visit the boss, it's a particular Tuesday. Uh, the boss is presumably his old friend or maybe a colleague, we, we don't have the information, but we know they know each other quite well. Uh, so what if he has come to visit the boss and they're having a conversation and the boss is feeling very superior. So the narrative actually tells you uh, it gave him uh, a smug, solid satisfaction to be planted opposite the frail old figure in the muffler. So the boss is basically constructing or accentuating his own masculinity in contrast to the uh, lack of masculinity embodied by Woodyfield. So Woodyfield's lack gives the boss a position of privilege, uh, a feeling of privilege, and I am so much better than this man. So it's a very, uh, you know, masculinist, very patriarchal, very narcissistic kind of superiority. The construct of superiority is through the other, right? The other which, who is defined by a lack. And we talked about this a little bit uh, in Heart of Darkness, how the entire idea of civilization, how the entire idea of European civilization and the superiority of civilization was strategically constructed through the other, the African other, the dark other, the uncivilized other. So that other was invented by Europe in order to you know, make them feel better about their own civilization, about their own superiority. So likewise, at a more intimate level, in this particular short story, the construct of the boss, the masculinist construct of the boss of social success, of you know, professional success, of emotional control, so all this is done uh, by contrasting it with the other. And the other over here happens to be Woodyfield, who basically is an embodiment of lack, an embodiment of the lack of privilege. See, he is not in control of his nerves. He doesn't have much of a financial agency. He doesn't have much of an agency whatsoever. He's not allowed to step out of his house except on Tuesdays. And he's someone who's controlled by his wife and his daughters. And then we get to know again that you know, uh, he had come here to tell something to the boss and now he's forgotten about him. 
Now, at this point in the short story, the boss opens his drawer and gives him and brings out a bottle of whiskey, alcohol, whiskey, which he very, uh, you know, with, again with the feeling of superiority, he pours down whiskey in a glass and gives it to Woodyfield and asks him to drink it and pours one for himself as well. Okay? And the two of them drink and then Woodyfield, uh, you know, he, he is so, uh, you know, he is amazed at his sight. He is fascinated by the fact that he is, you know, he is going to, he will now have whiskey and he tells the boss in a very feeble kind of a way that, you know, they don't let me touch this at home. In other words, he is medically not allowed to have alcohol, he is medically not allowed to have whiskey and for that reason, his wife and his daughters don't let him have whiskey at home, don't let him have any alcohol at home. Okay? So, again, you find that, you know, Woodyfield is not just emasculated in the short story, he is almost infantilized, he is almost like a child, he is almost like a baby who has been taken care of by the woman, the wife and the daughters. So, this infantilization of, the, of Woodyfield is a complete contrast to the masculinity of the boss, who is superior, who is strong, who is a social success and who is someone who is going on very well with his life. Okay? Now, in the moment Woodyfield says that my wife and my daughters don't let me touch alcohol at home, the boss's response is typically masculinist, it's typically quote unquote manly and he says that's where we know a bit more than a ladies. So, if you read the short story, you will find this is what the passage is. He tells Woodyfield, oh don't worry about that if they don't let you touch this at home, we, they, they are women, they don't know much. That's what we know more than our ladies. That's where we know more than our ladies. So again, the tone over here is very, very sexist. The tone over here is one of supremacy, of superiority, of the superiority of his gender. And he's obviously arrogant about his gender. There's a degree of masculine arrogance which he embodies, which he articulates in this particular passage. When he tells Woodyfield clearly, oh, don't worry about the fact that the woman don't let you drink at home. Uh, you know, we are two men here drinking on a Tuesday uh, and that we know better than a woman. So there's no need to consult the woman, there's no need to listen to the woman, uh, they don't let you drink at home, they don't know much. I know much better and this is going to help you. So, he pulls down a, a little bit of whiskey in a glass and gives it to Woodyfield and drinks one himself and the two of them drink and the entire passage is uh, sort of loaded, embedded uh, in very masculinist, uh, patriarchal, arrogant supremacy of gender. Okay? So, it's the white man's arrogance, the white man's supremacy of his own gender. Now, so Till this point in the short story, uh, it's very unidirectional. So, the boss is getting more and more superior, the boss is getting more and more manly, Woodyfield is getting less and less manly, Woodyfield is getting more and more infantilized and the boss is revealed to be someone who is a social success, who is in complete control, he knows, he knows what he is doing uh, and he wants to do, he does things that he wants to do, etc. He is someone who reads financial times, he is someone who has a magnificent office, he is someone who drinks whiskey in his office. So, he is very, very manly in every sense of the word. Whiskey to again, of course, is a very manly drink that he drinks with Woodyfield. Okay? So, this till this point in the, in the short story, there is no ambivalence at all about the boss's construct of manliness, about the boss's construct of masculinity. It's, it's completely unidirectional, it's completely monolithic masculinity, it's hegemonic masculinity, the white man's masculinity of superiority, of arrogance. This is the point in the short story that things begin to take a turn. Okay? So, the moment Woodyfield drinks the whiskey, the moment the Woodyfield consumes alcohol, uh, something gets inside his brain and he is a bit energized, he is a bit you know, animated and he remembers what he had come to tell the boss. Okay? So, the, the story had begun with Woodyfield uh, enviously looking at the boss, telling him that you know you are so, you know, you, you're so snug in here, you are so comfortable over here. Uh, and I have come here to tell you something, but I can't remember what is it. I'm shaking, I'm shivering, I'm senile. Uh, but when he drinks the whiskey that is given to him by the boss, he remembers what he had come here for. And what does he remember? He tells the boss, oh, by the way, I do not remember what I came here to say to you. And you know, the thing is, um, my wife and my daughters went to Belgium last week to take a look at poor Reggie's grave. Now, Reggie presumably is a son of Woodyfield and the reason why he's in the grave is because he's killed in the war. So, we now begin to get the, the complete narrative which was sort of hidden and now we get, we sort of go back and this is something which we should do as readers of literature that we should go back. The moment to get a point, the moment to get a, some kind of an interpretation, we must go back and look at something again and re-look and revisit some metaphor, some symbol which was offered to us before. Okay? And that symbol now uh, we begin to realize was that 
photograph of a grave-looking boy in uniform that the boss has planted in his office, uh, in his desk in his office, but he doesn't show that off to the people who come to his office. So now we begin to know that perhaps the boss too has lost his son in the First World War. Perhaps he too has suffered a loss. Perhaps he too is a mourner. Perhaps he too has suffered a bereavement. Perhaps not everything is not as great as it looks. So maybe the entire idea of appearing very manly, the entire idea of appearing very supreme, of superior, of having this gendered superiority, maybe this is a very superficial manner in which the boss wants to promote his masculinity and preserve it. Maybe it's a desperate attempt on the part of the boss. Maybe it's not so robust, maybe it's not so solid, maybe it's just fragile, maybe it's a desperate attempt for, on the part of the boss to appear very, very superior. Maybe it's just that. Okay. Now, at this point in the short story, we begin to get uh, that kind of information. So, Woodyfield goes on to tell the boss that, you know, my wife and my daughters were in Belgium last week taking a look at poor Reggie's grave and they happened to come by your sons. And this is the point in the short story when you get to know that, you know, the boss indeed had lost his son in the First World War. And then Woodyfield goes on to say, they're very close to each other, the two graves are very close to each other uh, and it's beautifully maintained, it's beautifully kept. It's beautifully looked after, uh, couldn't be better if they were at home, etc., etc. And then, interestingly, he goes on to many more minor details. He says, Did you know, by the way, how much that the hotel in which my wife and my daughter stayed, they really charged them an obscene amount of money for the jam, right? Uh, and it's supposed to be complimentary. And my wife brought it back with her just to teach them a lesson. Uh, and then he goes on to say, serves them right. Just because we're over there having a look uh, doesn't mean that they should trade on our feelings. So the idea, the point over here is, uh, the two British men, the British men are talking about the wife uh, and the daughters who had gone all the way to Belgium. Now, we don't know they're British. There could be someone in New Zealand, but it's definitely not Belgium. So the wife and the daughters are going to Belgium to take a look at the dead son's grave. Now, if you picture the entire thing in your mind and you begin to look at it from a lens of gender studies, what do we get? So we get the woman who are traveling, we get the woman who seem to have financial agency, we get the woman who are visiting uh, the site of loss where their men folk are buried. And the two old men over here, they sit and gossip about it. So isn't this an inversion of the entire gender principle that we are accustomed to? Because we are accustomed to thinking that men have money, men travel, men make the decisions, men control the woman, and the woman basically they stay at home and the gossip about what the men do, etc., etc. That's a very sexist, stereotypical, reductionist understanding of gender, the binary of gender. And that's something we saw in the Munshi Premchand short story where the women are imprisoned in the houses, as we saw very clearly. They're not allowed to step out to come to the Divan Khana, and it's the men who inhabit the Divan Khana. That's where they play chess, that's where they make all the business decisions, etc., etc. But in this particular short story, interestingly, we see it's a woman who travel. And they contrast that to Heart of Darkness. Uh, in Heart of Darkness, obviously, the women never travel. The women stay in their home uh, and they are lied to. The men go out, they conquer the world, they exploit other people, uh, sometimes they die, and they come back and misinform the woman. They give the woman a very romantic, rosy picture of what happens outside. The women never get to know. So, uh, Kutsu's intended in Heart of Darkness is very stereotypically a woman because she never gets to know what really happened to the man. She's misinformed, she's lied to, and she gets a romantic report of the reality. So she doesn't get to know the reality at all. And that's again a very reductionist, stereotypical way of locating gender. The women don't travel, the women don't get to know, the women don't have any access to knowledge. It's the men who have access to all this, and the women just stay at home and they just they're just talked to. Right? So they don't talk, they are talked to. So they never are the first person presence uh, in any situation. But in this particular short story by Mansfield, and again, this is interesting because this is perhaps the only short story that we, the only text that we'll do, which is written by a female writer. So the, the entire take is very different. The entire take is very, very, uh, and this is the reason why I've chosen it. If you contrast this with other texts which you've did, which you've done, you'll see, you will note the immediate difference. So the point here is. It's the women who have gone and traveled and they have been to the site of loss, they have been to where the graves are and they have come back and have reported to the men. So the complete inversion of what happens in Hollow Darkness. The men never traveled, the men did not travel, the men just stayed back 
would you feel straight back because of medical reasons, the boss straight back because of other reasons. I mean, you get to know the other reasons very, very soon. But the point is, uh, what Budifil is saying is that the woman, my wife and my daughters, they were there. Uh, they were looking around. They saw Reggie's grave, Reggie being the son. So, you know, he's it's, it's in a grave. And they happened to come by your sons, your boys, right? So, your boy's grave too is very close to where my boy's grave is. They're so very close to each other. And it's beautifully looked after. Nice, broad garden parks. And the entire description which follows subsequently is a very touristy kind of a description. So he talks about hotels, he talks about jam prices, he talks about the, you know, the expensive, the expenses in a hotel and expensive jam and how basically, uh, you know, his, his wife was very unhappy with the jam price and then she brought back the jam uh, with her in order to teach them a lesson, etc, etc. Now, I'll just end the lecture today on, again, I'll, I'll connect it to some social study, some cultural study, which, did, you know, which we should do and read this particular short story. Now, what we have in this section is an example of war tourism, right, or trauma tourism. War tourism or trauma tourism, where people go and travel to other places uh, to see the experience of trauma to relive the experience of trauma. So, for instance, the Holocaust now uh, is a very good example of trauma tourism. So, people go to Auschwitz and Poland to see the concentration camps of Nazis, to see the concentration camps of Germany, uh, and you know, people go there uh, to experience, to re-experience what it must have been for some of their relatives who may have been there, or just to be by it, to go there and take a look at uh, what it must have been uh, you know, for those people who are actually in there. So the entire tourism industry is sort of, it revolves around trauma, it revolves around war, it revolves around loss. So this too is an example of trauma tourism. So the Woodyfield's wife and daughters, they actually go to the graves in Belgium to take a look at the son's grave, right? To take a look at where the sons uh, lay buried, okay? So again, it's a woman traveling, it's a woman going all the way, it's a woman who have, seem to have agency, they appear to have agency, and they are the one looking down on the dead men. So just look at the entire picture. So the old men don't travel, they can't travel. One of them can't travel because of medical reason. Another person can't travel again for psychological reasons. And we get to know that as we read the short story later. So it's a woman who travel, the woman seem to have power, money, agency, etc. And the woman to go there, they look down on the dead men. So the men are either dead or crippled. They're either dead or agencyless. There's a complete inversion of the gender binary that we are accustomed to see. It is a complete inversion of the entire uh, you know, gender location, the gender roles that we are accustomed to see. So, the entire trauma tourism in Mansfield's Fly uh, is basically making a monument out of loss, making a museum out of loss, making a memory out of loss, a collective architecture of memory. So, the graveyard becomes an architecture of memory. It is like a museum, an open air museum of memory. People can go and revisit their graves of the dead men folk. They can go and revisit the, uh, the site of loss and they can basically mourn there and they can come back uh, feeling good about themselves. But the men don't go. So the, the idea is the men are either crippled, the men are either paralyzed psychologically or medically or they are dead. So again, this is the point I was trying to make a little while earlier. The entire population in this particular short story is peopled with dead men and old men. So there are no young healthy men left, right? So the entire masculinity map in Mansfield's uh, The Fly is a very problematic map. So it's either you're dead as a young man or you're crippled or you're psychologically paralyzed if you're an old man. So it's people by woman and uh, unhealthy, non-healthy men. And that's the entire demography in the short story, which by the way is a very authentic reflection of the real demography which took place, which, which was there, which featured immediately after the First World War. So immediately after the First World War, in a very real sense, there was no young men left. So there are very few young men, I'm not, I'm not going to exaggerate, there are very few young men who were actually there after the First World War, very few healthy young men. So the most of the young men who were there were either injured, wounded, traumatized, paralyzed and you know. So all the men who were there were either these men, the sick men, the non-healthy men and the old men. And of course this is a time when the women were coming out of the houses, the women were taking up occupations or professions which were hitherto controlled by the men. And the occupations, the professions were very much a part of civil society, public civil society like bus conductors, bus drivers, tram conductors, etc. So they seem to have more agency. It's a movement 
Again, if you look at the way, if you compare, it's the death of imperialism, it's the beginning of the end of imperialism, also and equally, it's the beginning of the end of patriarchy, of patriarchal control, and it's the beginning of the emancipation of the colonies, it's the beginning of the emancipation of the women. So the First World War is a real symbolic event, uh, which really begins to trigger, begins to trigger uh, historically all these different phenomena. The end of imperialism, the end of patriarchal control, the end of masculinist control, and the beginning of the liberation of colonies, the beginning of the liberation of women. And this is a short story which is basically at that cusp of change. Right? It's, a, it's a short story that historically is at the cusp of change, where the manly men are not so manly anymore, and it's the women who seem to have more control over their life and what is around them. So we'll continue with the short story in the next lecture, and this concludes the first lecture. So thank you for listening, and I'll see you again as we move on with Mansfield's Fly. Thank you very much.